Um, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Handel Wright. I'm a professor in the Department of Educational Studies, and I'm director of the Center for Culture, Identity, and Education uh, here at the University of British Columbia. And um, uh, today I'm working from my home in the city of Richmond. And I want to acknowledge that what is now called Richmond, this place where I live and in the times of the continued global pandemic, the place from which I work some of the time is part of the traditional uh, and unceded land of some of the Coast Salish peoples, um, including the Kwantlen, the Toasan and the Moschium. Um, now we at the Center for Cultural Identity and Education are pleased to welcome um, all of you to this panel discussion. Um, uh, thanks are usually reserved for the end of things, but sometimes I like to start <laughs> by thanking people, uh, just in case uh, some of you have to leave by the end. Um, so, uh, I want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Ainsley Carey, um, who's one of the panelists for today, um, because it's his recent work and some of our discussions about his book that was the spark for what has become uh, this panel today. Uh, so thank you, Ainsley, for that. Um, I'd also like to thank Professor Andre Mazawi, who is head of my Department of Educational Studies and someone who has made con uh, considerable contributions to the work of the CCIE and its projects. Uh, and last, but definitely not least, I'd like to thank um, uh, Ezra El Mufta, who's a doctoral student in the Department of Educational Studies and the GAA for the Center for Culture, Identity, and Education. Ezra has been responsible for many aspects of today's panel from design of the poster, um, to the poster to preparatory communications with the panelists to uh, again, helping to co-host um, today's Zoom session. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, session that we've titled Disputed Monuments, Honorees and Symbols uh, on university campuses. Um, and our presenters, and I'll, I'll introduce each of them um, in turn, our presenters are Dr. Ainsley Carey, who's Vice President of Students here at UBC, Dr. Catherine Ellis, who's an Associate Professor of History at, at the University, uh, at Ryerson University, or what was once called Ryerson University, the soon to be renamed Ryerson University, and Dr. Tonya Davidson, um, who's an instructor at the Department of uh, Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. So since about 2015, students, faculty, and staff have openly expressed their displeasure with controversial memorials on university campuses. Um, some of the work that I've done and some of the things I've been connected with include what has happened in South Africa, where um, student defacement of the statue of uh, Cecil Rhodes at the University of Cape Town sparked um, the national hashtag fallist uh, movement. Rhodes must fall, some call it, uh, fees must fall, others call it a decolonization movement, which is student-led, generative, and is about the remaking of the university in South Africa and linked with decolonization and Africanization of the university and of knowledge. The rethinking of ontology, epistemology, and axiology. It started when Chumani Maxwele, a student at the University of Cape Town, threw a bucket of human feces onto a bronze statue of Rhodes. Uh, under enormous student and public pressure, uh, pressure on the 27th of March, 2015, the University of Cape Town's Senate voted in favor of removing the prominently placed statue of Cecil Rhodes from the UCT campus. And this took place on the 9th of April. So Rhodes is, a sim is symbolic of the taken for granted but problematic nature 
of the university itself. The initial protest and students for this movement's main point is that the university in South Africa is built on an exclusivist, colonialist, and racist foundation. Protesting the defacement was considered the first step in rethinking the university, in building a democratic, non-colonialist university, and indeed society. So it's this kind of thing that we want to discuss today uh, in this session that we've titled Disputed Monuments, Honorees, and Symbols on University Campuses. And the way we'll proceed is we'll start with um, Dr. Carey, then uh, Dr. Ellis, and then Dr. Uh, Davidson. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you who are present today as part of the audience. Um, I think it might be best if we have all the three presenters um, give their, their presentations, and then we can have time for discussion of the issues. So in terms of discussions, um, you are able to write, if you're an audience member, um, your thoughts and your questions in the chat. Um, so you can do so whilst the presentations are going on, or you can wait till after and then pose a question to, to one or more um, or all of the, the, um, the presenters, and, um, and we will take it from there. Um, only uh, myself and Ezra can actually see what you write in the chat, and I will use the opportunity as sort of facilitator to um, actually pose those questions uh, to the panelists. So um, without too much more ado, um, I'd like to start to introduce the panelists. Um, and starting with Dr. Ainsley Carey. Um, Dr. Carey is a three-time graduate of the University of Florida where he earned his bachelor's, master's and doctorate in higher education administration. He also earned master's degrees in business administration and studies in law from Auburn University and the University of Southern California, respectively. Dr. Carey's career includes vice presidencies at Urban University, the University of Southern California, and currently since 2019, he has been vice president students here at the University of British Columbia. And um, in his second book, which is what sparked the idea for uh, the, our panel today, which is titled Washington Next, Disputed Monuments, Honorees, and Symbols on Campus, uh, Carrie tackles the complicated leadership challenge uh, confronting memorial landscapes that marginalize students of color. Uh, providing an environment where all students thrive is an ethical responsibility for us all. School memorials are deeply rooted in an inescapable American history that requires us to grapple with the truth. So um, welcome, Dr. Carey, and we'll now hear your presentation. Well, thank you, Dr. Wright. And as you mentioned, it's often appropriate to do thank yous at the end, but I would like to thank you right now for all of your work to pull this discussion together. I would also like to thank my, my colleagues, Dr. Ellis and Dr. Davidson, for participating in this conversation. These are bold conversations, um, bold conversations about leadership and about universities. And the reason why I describe them as bold is because individuals who take on this work are often attacked. For their, for their time and energy in exploring a university's emotional trauma that's embedded in memorials and names and symbols. So I wanna thank them for being so bold today, um, not only for the personal trauma that this work takes on, but sometimes the external attacks on people that try to do this type of work. My comments will focus largely on American colleges and universities. And that is one reason why I'm so delighted that my colleagues are joining me to bring forward the Canadian perspective on some of these issues, because many of these memorial challenges in the US are also right here in Canada. As we see with the protests going on right now on, on our borders, you'll notice the Confederate flag has made its way into the debate. And the so the symbolism and the meaning behind the Confederate flag, although the Civil War only happened in the US, it is not unique to the US, the beliefs that are carried in that flag. So I'm delighted that my colleagues are here to share the Canadian perspective. 
I started this work because I was examining the expansion of equity, diversity, and inclusion. EDI is rapidly expanding. Some of us might remember in the 70s and 80s, universities were focused on adding diversity. That was the driving force. Enrolling more students of color, enrolling more, involving more faculty of color, both domestic and international. In the 80s and 90s, equity became the emerging institutional values. But then in the early 2000s, we started to be introduced to the term inclusion, which is meaning, which means bring more of that diversity and equity to the decision-making tables. Yet today, the equity, diversity, and inclusion universe also includes social justice and landscape fairness. I'm here to focus my comments on landscape fairness and what that means. When I started doing this research, I was the vice president for students at the University of Southern California. American universities across the country, including in Los Angeles, were being faced with a number of student protests demanding more equity, diversity, and inclusion on campus. But at the end of their protest, there was this kind of small footnote that said, and we also want to examine campus landscapes, building names, memorials. Well, in 2015, universities didn't really address it until students continued um, their protests and the uprise that we saw on campus. When I started to study this, I found a number of tragedies that led to memorials being the center point of protest. So from 2015 to 2020, American colleges and universities experienced this dramatic rise in memorial disputes on campus. In my research, I found three tragedies that led to this um, energy from students, faculty, and staff. One, in June of 2015, a 21-year-old white male entered a predominantly Black church in Charleston, South Carolina. At the end of an hour-long Bible study, the young man revealed his true intention of joining the church that day. The gunman um, pulled out a weapon and shot nine out of 12 churchgoers. Investigators soon discovered that he worshiped the Confederate flag and was radicalized on the internet. Within two weeks, the South Carolina lawmakers broke what was a four decade long legislative dispute, a stalemate about where the Confederate flag should be flown in South Carolina. At the time it was flown on the state house. The South Carolina lawmakers agreed to remove the Confederate flag. In South Carolina, this is a historic move because they had fought against removing the Confederate flag for decades. But two years later, tragedy would strike again. And in August of 2017, protesters and counter protesters clashed in the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia to protest a proposal about removing a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Then a self-proclaimed white nationalist rammed his car at full speed into a crowd of protesters. He ended up killing one person and severely injuring 19 others. In response to this violence and this rally, then President Donald Trump placed blame on both sides and defended Confederate memorials by asking the question, who's next? This week it's Robert E. Lee, is George Washington next? And that was the catalyst for this research question. Many people saw it as a rhetorical statement. I saw it as actually a question for us to consider would a nation ever truly consider the complete examination of its so-called founding fathers to examine their involvement in colonialization, in slavery, in segregation, and the other? And would a nation ever reconsider how they memorialize those individuals? But before we can get even further, tragedy would strike again. And in May of 2020, a Minneapolis police officer killed George Floyd while onlookers pleaded for Floyd's life. Within weeks, corporations, cities, and universities revisited all of their memorial disputes. Memorial disputes are not new. They didn't begin in 2015. They are decades old. However, in 2015, they took on a new life and new attention that universities have to pay attention to them. So all three of these events raised awareness about the dangers of Confederate memorial landscapes and persistent racial inequalities. Prior to this, people had brought up concerns about memorial landscapes, and those concerns were dusted off. They didn't pay much attention to them. 
after we started making the connection between violence and these memorials, I think the connection was made clear to others that it was time to re-examine all of our memorials in cities and on campus. Now, in my research in Washington Next, Disputed Monuments and Memorials on Campus, I analyzed dozens of memorial um, disputes on university campuses. I'm very specific about those disputes on campus because those disputes also happened in major US cities, and towns and, and um, communities and states. But I wanted to understand what they looked like on campus and what were the patterns and themes necessary to navigate those disputes on campus. In the book, I feature 25 universities and 56 disputed memorials. Disputed memorials included statues, monuments, symbols, and building names. The honorees were accused of the following, colonization, owning enslaved people. They were Confederate soldiers. They were involved in eugenics. They were segregationists. They were heavily involved in voter suppression. They were leaders of the Confederate army and they were leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. Those are the memorials that are being disputed on college campuses throughout the United States right now. These are people who cheated their way into a university. These are individuals who have allegedly participated in things that today we see as heinous crimes. So in Washington Next, I analyzed 25 university responses to memorial disputes. Here were some of the common themes. The catalyst has always been student protests. Students drove and started this on every university campus. Then faculty would join and then staff would join, but it always started with students. The president would follow with issuing a charge. There were four types of charges that came from a president. One, in some universities, they would say, examine the name. Don't tell us the name, but should the name remain or should the name be changed? So keep your dispute or your examination just to the name. Another type of charge was contextualization. How should we contextualize the name? Meaning the name is gonna stay. Now we need to find ways to contextualize the name by adding plaques and descriptors around the name so people become comfortable with the name but it's not gonna change. The third charge from a president included establishing principles and then deciding what should happen. So create a set of guidelines and then the task force would decide what to do with those guidelines. In the fourth type of charge, it was only to establish principles and then the board would apply the naming decision-making. In every case in the US, the final decision was not the president's. The final decision is usually the board of trustees or your board of governors. Usually task forces are composed of about 12 individuals on average. And there were three types of decisions made, retain the memorial, remove the memorial or relocate the memorial. Out of the 56 in the study in the book, 23 were retained, 25 were removed and eight were relocated. But most importantly, there were four frameworks that emerged out of all of the discussions, four frameworks that I believe every task force must consider. Some task forces examine memorials from a single lens, picked one issue and said, let's examine that. The honoree um, owned enslaved people or the honoree was a Confederate soldier. In the most complex and comprehensive versions, a task force would examine at least four frames. One, is what I call the principal legacy question. For what is the honoree primarily known? Many historical figures live lives of good and bad deeds. They made mistakes and they had regrets. They were products of a completely different era than our own. But for what was the honoree known in totality? What was their entire life about? What was their principal legacy is the first question. The next question examined in the book is what's called the heritage protection or preservation question. What is worthy of being preserved? What is worthy of being protected? Initially, preservation were laws were born in the United States and around the world to preserve unique cultural artifacts, things that were built hundreds and thousands of years ago that are unique. And if these things are ever lost, it's a loss to all of humanity. 
does a memorial on your campus deserve this type of protection? Is it a unique cultural artifact that can never be replaced? The third question is a question about landscape fairness. How does the campus memorial impact feelings of equity and inclusion for all? Some universities had memorials, um, had buildings honoring those who were slaveholders, yet they were asking students to live, study, and eat in buildings where the honoree did not think they were human. The honoree did not think they should go to school at that university. The honoree was completely against interracial marriage. The honoree was a segregationist, yet some universities continue to ask students to live, eat, and study in that space. Landscape fairness um, encourages us to interrogate that question. Is it fair to ask students to live in these spaces where people did not honor them? And the fourth and final frame is the moral standards question. Which standards should be used? Past standards of 1850 or current standards of 2020? Which standards should be used to determine memorialization? In memorial disputes, participants make judgments based on one of these two perspectives. They apply standards of the past and say this behavior was permitted then, or they apply standards of today and say, according to today's standards, this behavior is inappropriate. But the final point that I'd like to make in every memorial dispute, I believe this type of multi-frame thinking is required. Sometimes we'll get to the same answers that we've gotten to right now, but we should consider the entire complexity of the memorial question. Picking a single frame actually silences the voices of others who have other concerns to bring to the table and minimizes the complexity of the issue down to a single issue. Thank you for your time and I'll look forward to this, the discussion. Handel, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Ainsley. Um, uh, I, I think Ainsley's um, outlined so well um, how the situation played out uh, in the US. It's playing out uh, interestingly, maybe somewhat differently in, in Canada. We do want to turn our attention now to the Canadian situation. One of the things that uh, Ainsley was pointing to is uh, um, different institutions were trying to look at, well, well, what did these figures stand for? What is the objection? What are the things that um, people are objecting to? And, and the name Cecil Rhodes is so very well known that sometimes we, we almost forget because it's passed, it, it's almost the name has passed into a sort of common sense. You know, people want to be a Rhodes scholar, for example. So it's more than South Africa, but the effects and his thoughts about uh, white people and about black people and about Africa are well worth noting. Um, so when the fallist movement started, people say, well, what's the big objection to Cecil Rhodes? You must think that he, he was somebody who spoke about uh, his strong belief that the Anglo-Saxon race was the finest race in the world. And here's a quote from him about Africa. Rhodes said, Africa is still lying ready for us. Uh, it is our duty to take it. It is our duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory. And we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes, that more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best of the human, of the human, the most human, most honorable race the world possesses. So when we want to look at evidence of what it is that people have said and what they stand for, we should keep those kinds of things uh, in, in mind. So in the Canadian situation, people are now beginning to examine uh, some of the names that we also take for granted, um, uh, including the naming of certain universities after certain prominent figures from Canadian history. Uh, usually uh, men. So we'll now turn to the Canadian situation and we'll turn to Dr. Catherine Ellis. Um, uh, 
to give us uh, her talk. Uh, Dr. Ellis is an associate professor in the Department of History at what was, still is, maybe not too long, too long, continue to be uh, Ryerson University because its renaming is in progress. In 2020 to 2021, she co-chaired the Standing Strong Task Force, um, um, which examined um, uh, the uh, the figure of uh, Egerton Ryerson uh, in relation to uh, the university. And the, the task force submitted its final report, I believe in August of 2021. Um, and inviting her to this panel gave me an opportunity to read the entire task force report. It makes for fascinating reading if you haven't read it. The task force deployed, uh, developed principles to guide commemoration at the university and to respond to the history and leg legacy uh, of its namesake, um, Egerton Ryerson. So um, over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Handel, for your warm welcome and the center's very kind invitation to participate uh, today. I'm, I'm really delighted to learn so much from this conversation and, uh, and from everyone who's, who's chosen to join us today. Uh, I guess what I'm going to offer today is a little bit of a, a case study of the sort of thing that Ainsley was, was talking about in a Canadian context and quite a recent one. So I'll start with a, a little bit of background on the Standing Strong Task Force. Uh, the task force was appointed in the fall of 2020 by the president of Ryerson University, which is, as Handel said, uh, soon to be renamed. The task force was co-chaired by myself and by Elder Joanne Dallaire, the university's elder and senior advisor on Indigenous relations. There were 14 members of the task force in total, including the two co-chairs. Um, Joanne and I were not involved in any decisions about the composition of the task force, but I know that the university president sought advice from many quarters, both within and outside the university, as he was planning a whole endeavor, uh, including the decision in the first place to address the legacy and commemoration through uh, appointing a task force, as well as deciding on its composition and deciding on uh, its mandate. The members of the task force included current students, staff and faculty at the university, as well as alumni and other people who were external to the university who could bring uh, various types of expertise and experience in a wide range of fields, including black history, law, public art, human rights and indigenous knowledges and cultures. Now, the mandate of the task force was very clear which helped enormously to guide our work. And over a period of about nine months, we fulfilled our mandate through three concurrent streams of work, research, community engagement, and the task force members' own uh, learning and unlearning. And through all of those interconnected elements, uh, they informed our development of 22 recommendations that we made to the university president last August, 2021. We were able to complete that work earlier than the original timeline had specified. Uh, the whole group remained intact and we reached consensus with our recommendations. That was followed by full approval from the university's board of governors. But uh, as Ainsley's work has demonstrated, uh, the outcome that we were fortunate to uh, get is not inevitable. And it was due to a number of factors that uh, not, only, not only me, I wanna give full credit uh, to many others involved in the task force for reflecting on uh, sort of debriefing and, and thinking through how the task force went and the kinds of lessons that we've learned from that process and from those who are carrying on uh, the work of implementing the recommendations. So I think our, our success, if you wanna call it that, was due to a number of factors. And I wanna highlight them briefly because they put our recommendations in context, including the recommendation to rename the university. Uh, I think they also speak to how universities can approach these processes if they are truly committed to addressing their entanglement with colonial legacies. So the first thing that I think contributed very strongly to our, our uh, success and the outcomes that we've had was that we had the full support of the university's senior leadership. 
Uh, they did not intervene in any way. We reported regularly to them, um, but they did not exert any influence. They did not apply pressure uh, to us. Uh, the task force had complete autonomy. Uh, we also issued our own communications and progress reports, and even our own report, uh, which uh, Ezra was kind enough to put a link to, I believe, uh, in the chat, has a, a very different look and feel, if you will, from reports issued by other uh, units within the university. And that was, that was very conscious and I think important to the way in which we were able to conduct our work and the fact that we were making recommendations directly to the president. Secondly, uh, but related to that level of very high level of support and commitment from the senior leadership was the fact that the task force uh, was very well resourced. Uh, no matter how committed and knowledgeable and thoughtful all the task force members themselves were, and, uh, and they certainly were. You know, we demanded a great deal from them, uh, more than 50 hours of meetings, everything on a voluntary basis, a lot of reading and, and reflection outside uh, that as well. We still needed many other supports, and those included a full-time uh, project and community engagement manager who became the backbone, really, of, of the whole endeavor. We also had a team of researchers. Uh, we had staff seconded from several other offices at the university, and we had the uh, enormously important assistance of librarians and archivists, both from our own university and elsewhere, and lots of other internal and external support for the community engagement period uh, that we did. So it was a truly a team effort, and we were not constrained uh, by any kind of lack of resources or limits on the resources. And I think that's really important and sets us apart from a number of other initiatives at other universities and uh, institutions and cities and so on. Uh, thirdly, if we turn inward to the structures and values of the Standing Strong Task Force uh, itself, uh, the ones that we chose, uh, we certainly recognized that we were functioning within a colonial model of higher education. But the task force intentionally applied indigenous paradigms to its work in that context. What that meant was that we centered relationship building and that we worked, although entirely virtually, uh, the whole task force was done virtually, uh, we worked within the concept of, of a circle. And as we noted in our report, we were guided by the belief that no one is above, no one is below, no one is ahead and no one is behind. And regardless of age, stage, or position, everyone's voice was equally valued. And that model guided our engagement with each other, but also framed our wider engagement with, with the public, with the community. And moreover, we strove to reach consensus. In fact, reaching consensus was part of our, our mandate. And we did so by genuinely listening to each other and reflecting on different perspectives and having that goal of consensus in mind really shaped uh, the way in which we, we carried out our work, engaged with each other and developed the relationships uh, within the group. Fourthly, um, the ways in which we structured our community engagement reflected those indigenous paradigms. We consciously rejected uh, the more common kind of town hall type model of consultation. And we developed instead a model for community engagement that was unlike any other that had been used previously at the university. Uh, that was a model that prioritized accessibility and equity by providing community members with multiple ways to participate on their own time and on their own terms, whether that was individually or through what we termed community conversations, where people could, could invite or come together with a group of their choice, however large or small that might be, uh, to work through a toolkit that we provided with a series of, of prompts and questions and ways of framing a conversation so that they would remain uh, respectful and constructive. And then they could choose whether or not they wanted to report back on their conversations uh, directly to the task force. They could do that as a group, or they could take the, their conversations and reflections and share those individually uh, as well with us. All of the input to the task force was anonymous as well, again, in keeping with that concept of, of everyone and every voice being equal. 
Uh, we also engaged in very extensive community outreach and we kept the engagement period open for a full two months. Uh, we also accepted uh, submissions from before the community engagement period started and uh, afterwards as we were um, developing the, the final stages of the report. And as a result, we heard from over 11,000 people who shared their ideas. Other groups at the university have subsequently adopted aspects of this model uh, for their own community engagement initiatives. Uh, so we can see the, the, the impact um, of, of the way in which we decided to approach it, uh, not only through uh, what we considered a very successful community engagement process, but the ways in which others now want to adopt it to get, um, I hope, similar, similar outcomes. Uh, I'll turn now to the, the report and recommendations themselves. Uh, as I said, in August, we submitted our report to the president. The report explicitly recognized the harm that was caused by the university's failure to prioritize the legacies of colonialism and the harm caused by associations with our namesake, Edgerton Ryerson, over a long period of time. And back to, to Ainsley's observation earlier, um, this was by no means uh, the beginning of the conversation. We knew that those conversations and concerns had existed for several decades, at least. And so we acknowledge that. We also acknowledge that our work was building on and benefiting from many years of activism on and off campus, particularly by Indigenous and Black community members. So what we were really trying to do uh, was to develop recommendations that would lead to meaningful and lasting change while also recognizing and supporting the important work that was already happening on campus and not presenting ourselves as exceptional, uh, not reinventing the wheel, um, but really trying where we could to support and amplify uh, initiatives and ideas and voices that were already uh, very much present on campus and off. Right? We understood we were operating within a much larger context. Our report includes 22 recommendations that form a comprehensive and values-based framework of reforms and initiatives that cover virtually all aspects of the university's functions, from decisions about current and future commemoration on campus, through to physical spaces, both indoor and outdoor spaces, we uh, made recommendations related to increasing the accessibility of historical research for the whole community. We heard a lot of interest from the community in knowing more uh, about uh, the university's history, about Edgerton Ryerson, and about the colonial past in which, uh, in the land on which we are located and the history of our presence there. We also included recommendations around learning and unlearning uh, within the curricula of every academic program and uh, other items such as the rethinking of the university's mascot, which was named after Edgerton Ryerson. So we tried to cover uh, many, many different facets of the operation of the university. Each recommendation was clearly presented in the report in connection to the university's values and addressing the ongoing impact of commemorating Edgerton Ryerson. But critically, our recommendations reflect the need for all of us to educate ourselves as a key part of the journey toward reconciliation and decolonization. Our recommendations we, we recognized and we tried to make clear are only the first step. And there is much more to do. Uh, but the responsibility to educate really lies with us. The task force provided some resources uh, to do that and the impetus, I hope, uh, to build momentum toward doing that but we really need to continue building on it through the implementation stages, which are now underway. So I'll conclude with uh, some reflections on, on the larger context for renaming, uh, which I know is on everyone's mind, although uh, it is one of the 22 recommendations that the task force made. Uh, recommendation number four is that the university shall be renamed through a consultative process. That process is well underway and the university president has stated that a new name will be in place before the next academic year. That will make us the first post-secondary institution in the country, I believe, to rename on account of colonial connections. Now, sometimes, uh, maybe more often than not, uh, when the removal of a statue or the renaming of a building or an institution 
uh, is discussed, there's the perception that the person themselves is somehow on trial. And critics of the process or critics of the outcome may uh, call for the person to be acquitted of charges against them, to be exonerated, to be vindicated uh, in, in some way through the task force or the inquiry that has gone on. Now, in our case, our, our recommendations were informed by very extensive and rigorous historical research, but they're really about so much more than the history of one individual. They are the outcome of conversations about legacy and about commemoration more generally, specifically the impact of ongoing commemoration of colonial legacies here and now, and the aspirations of the community that we heard very strongly through our community engagement process. So our recommendations are very future oriented. Uh, we, we asked ourselves what kind of university we want to be and uh, looking through more of an indigenous uh, worldview, what kind of ancestors we want to be. And those were the sort of guiding principles behind our, our recommendations. Throughout the process, then the task force was very clear that no one was on trial. Uh, we were not passing judgment. Rather, we considered the totality of Edgerton Ryerson's work along with his legacy. And legacy is both the impact of someone or something like, like a, a battle, an event, uh, and the ways in which that impact is experienced and understood and remembered publicly by a variety of people over time. And so we considered that uh, Ryerson's legacy within the context of the university's core values and a very wide range of ideas and feelings that were shared by thousands of people, both inside and outside the university. All 22 of our recommendations were driven by an understanding of legacy and whether it continues to align with our present day values. Ultimately, the decision to change the university's name should not be understood as a condemnation of the person, uh, Ryerson specifically, but rather it reflects the ongoing impact of the university's commemoration of him, given his legacy. And we understood our work within this much larger context. Our goal was to create a more inclusive campus culture and environment. And we came to understand that our university's name tied us to the country's colonial past. And that past is inextricably connected to separate and racially segregated schooling, to the genocide of indigenous peoples, and to cultural erasure. All of those Edgerton Ryerson uh, was involved with, but was by no means uh, the sole actor. So the university is now on its fourth name since it was founded in 1948. And uh, a new name uh, we found was essential, is essential, because the current name is causing harm. For a long time, that name uh, created opportunities and now it impedes them. And so for all of those reasons, uh, the university really, uh, we found had to be renamed. And by and large, that decision has been uh, welcomed, not only within the university, but uh, very strongly outside. So thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to share a bit of, bit of our work with you. Th thank you so very much, um, Catherine. Um, um, the, the, your presentation following Ainsley's does uh, so much. Ainsley gave us this overview and your presentation was if we take one of these cases and we look at it um, as an example, um, you went into such depth about the, the very interesting work um, uh, of the task force. And I was particularly fascinated um, by how the, the task force incorporated and really was guided by uh, indigenous ways of, of knowing uh, and thinking and, and doing work. I, it, it just really struck me um, uh, as an example of how this could be done. Of course, there are other places in Canada where um, the, the, the names uh, of universities are, are being examined, re-examined. It's happening at Dalhousie University. Um, it's happening at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, so institutions are, 
uh, problematizing the, the beforehand supposedly unvarnished images of these figures and what they mean for our contemporary times uh, and and for our few, uh, he used this wonderful phrase I I'll never forget which is what kind of ancestors do we want to be a um, way of thinking of the present uh, and our legacy to to the future I really um, appreciated that part of what we wanted to do on this panel was not only to speak to um, um, universities specifically but both Ainsley and Catherine told us about how this then got into community as well and how community got involved. So we wanted to have somebody who could speak to how we look at, uh, at monuments, um, how we remember, both of, both of you talked about uh, memory in some ways, uh, but somebody who deals with that work more explicitly in a broader sense beyond the university. We had to make some hard choices about who would be on this panel. Um, uh, but we landed on, on Dr. Davidson um, as somebody who could bring us the, the larger picture. Uh, Dr. Davidson received her PhD in sociology from the University of Alberta and is an instructor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. Her research interests have focused on questions of memory, um, national belonging, and the built environment. Uh, she's interested in urban spaces, in public memory, in nostalgia, uh, public culture, and Canadian identity. More specifically for our theme for today, um, Tonya has spent many years studying the social lives of statues in Ottawa very specifically. I'm sure that will resonate with everybody as we have seen what has happened with um, the so-called freedom convoy um, and its appropriation and what some think of it um, and um, the way that they have taken up or not taken up or used or abused the Terry Fox statue and the war memorial and what kinds of memorials we, we consider to be sacred and why and all of that. Um, and I think it was, uh, we made this choice before all of this, but I think it's particularly appropriate that we have Dr. Davidson to give us moving from this camp campus take to the larger society take. Uh, and the lives, um, I love this idea of the lives of statues, the social lives of statues. Um, Dr. Davidson, please. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for having me. Uh, I feel like after coming last um, pre presents some great opportunities and challenges because I really want to just respond to what I just heard, um, but I think I can uh, fold that into what I'm about to say. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to riff a little bit because I'm going last and, because, and I'm going to start uh, not the way I intended, but I'm going to start instead by um, bringing up a story that my friends accuse me of bringing up way too often because I'm proud of it. This one time I debated, uh, well, I was on a panel, but there are only two of us, so it's even more like a debate um, with Aaron O'Toole to talk about Johnny McDonald monuments and he and what sh what should happen to them. Uh, and he brought up, he evoked Yale's process that um, I'm sure Ainsley was very familiar with of what to do with um, buildings that all have these these fraught names. And he was supporting it and he said, you know, what, what we need to do in Canada with Johnny McDonald statues is we can't just like willy nilly with our feelings be responding. We should do what Yale did. They had this systematic thing. And just like what, what you were talking about, Ainsley, thinking about principal legacy and these things. Um, but my my response at the time is that, uh, which I still, still agree with, is that this idea that deferring to um, systems that are imagined to be rational that is an inherently a very white colonial and patriarchal logic because the person who is deeming what is logical is or, or the people that are read to be logical and rational have historically been um, white men. So that's not a great system. Um, 
And we see that in the, in the context of Ottawa, we have historically had, um, beyond these sort of systems premised on understandings of rationality, we have seen a lot of monument contests come down to um, deferral to whiteness that has actually taken the form of deferral to ancestors, but in a, in a way that's different from what, what Catherine's talking about. So there's just a few moments I, I'm thinking of. Um, there was a one monument to, um, there is a monument to Samuel. Well, he's currently missing. I think he's being polished at the moment. They're renovating the hill that he sits on to Samuel de Champlain. And for about 760 years, there was a, a monument to um, an unnamed indigenous guide at his feet. And it was very sort of racist in its representation. So there was a uh, protest and the statue was ultimately removed in the 90s. But before they removed the statue, the um, governing monument governing board here in Ottawa, the National Capital Commission, contacted the great great niece of the sculptor of the monument, um, Hamilton McCarthy. So we see in this mo movement moment a real deferral to whiteness happening there. And a similar thing happened with um, Emily, there's a, a statue to Emily McClung, who is a first wave feminist, but also very noted um, a supporter of, of eugenics. Um, and her great great niece came out in support of the monument. So we see that the, how ancestors are evoked often in ways that um, um, that are a deferral to whiteness. Um, but that is just sort of my, my uh, just one second. Here we go. My um, initial thoughts after after hearing you today. Um, but my main idea that I want to present uh, comes from years of, of studying um, a few, not nearly as many monument cases as Aisley did, uh, but I focused really on, on a few monuments in Ottawa. Um, and what I found in my uh, research is that the thing about monuments is that they are, they are um, very much about what they do is they generate public feelings about things. And in this doing, they are inherently very dynamic, urban, alive, present things, right? So this also is thinking um, about what Ainsley said about thinking about unique cultural artifacts as this sort of justification for keeping monuments. Um, my argument is always that regardless of their sort of intent of when they're built and this artistic merit, by putting monuments in urban places, they're part of our present and they should be treated in that way. Okay, that is a lot of preface. I will tell you just a few stories um, from Ottawa um, that, that highlight that uh, monuments have dynamic lives that move in multiple directions. So um, the first very dominant monument in, in Ottawa, the National War Memorial, it was unveiled uh, six months before the outbreak of World War II. It is a monument to World War I. Um, but throughout its life, so from 1939 to today, um, a lot has happened at the monument and how we can engage with it has changed tremendously. Um, and I would, um, I argue that sort of aura of sacredness has really um, been generated around this monument over the last many um, decades. So at the time of its unveiling, um, it was unveiled in a moment of great ritual. It was a royal tour. Um, the King, King George and Queen Elizabeth unveiled it on their tour of Canada. Apparently it was the moment where O Canada was sung for the first time as our national anthem. Um, it was born into a life of ritual, um, and that has continued. Um, so we have a very specific um, form of ritual interactions with very um, structured laying of wreaths that you see um, here, uh, which is also very gendered. The, the, the Silver Cross Mother is the second to lay the wreath after um, the governor general. So we have lots of, of 
um, ideas or feelings about not just about the war, but also how commemorating the war is is a way of feeling Canadian. Um, and we see this uh, especially true during rituals that emerged after they, um, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier was installed in, in 2000. Um, and in that year, the first after the first Remembrance Day, a sort of invented tradition emerged where people laid their poppies on the tomb. So this really, while, while large rituals like the regular um, Remembrance Day ritual televised and widely attended, de definitely was a moment to generate this sort of effective attachment to Canada. Um, laying the poppies produced an added layer of personal to national connection. Um, but we also see at the same time that other things happen at the War Memorial, um, act, multiple acts of defacement, that things that are read as defacement and, and other, well, in, in many ways, um, that challenge and reinforce the ideas of, of belonging produced here. Um, so, for example, um, the Legion led ritual of, of wreath laying it covers the three sides of the monument. Um, but for many years, I saw a lone white poppy wreath laid at the back. And the white poppy is an um, emblem that emerged um, also in the interwar period to challenge the sort of dominant hegemony of, of the Legion led. Um, war um, commemoration rituals. And the white poppy wreath here uh, suggests that or, or illuminates that remembrance of the war memorial is very limited. How we are allowed to feel at the war memorial has been very highly constrained by our um, ritual practices. Um, and it's sort of this, this moment of laying this white poppy wreath like evokes um, something offers a sort of crack in the monument. Um, also, there's a other story about um, so so Canadians and allies can lay wreaths at the war memorial, and for many years Australians have laid a wreath there on their Anzac Day, um, which is a big national moment for them. However, um, for many about seven years, a group of Baltic Canadians try to lay in Ottawa try to lay a wreath on a day to commemorate. Um, this day when 60,000 people from the Baltic region were sent to, to Russia on this day in World War II. They were routinely denied permission to do this. And the, the message was that, no, the war memorial is for Canadian, to commemorate Canadian war losses and the losses of their allies. So here at the, at the National War Memorial, the idea of nationhood is really quite tightly um, written but there are moments where it is also challenged. So we have the white poppy wreath, um, but we also have, um, not on this slide, where there was a public urination moment in 2006, which led to the installation of the sentry, guarded sentry. Um, and then of course, in you're probably familiar in 2014, one of those sentry, um, Nathan Cirillo was, was murdered. Um, so these are all of these moments. So the response to the public urination led to more security. And then after this murder, there was more security, which has contributed to this sort of aura. Um, I put in contrast, we have this picture from 1945. This was when the monument was only six years old. These kids on the shoulders of the soldier, the headline here wasn't bad kids to face monument. The headline was, Ottawa celebrates VJ Day, big dancing in the street. So there, we see that in the life of this monument, interactions with it have changed over time. And I would say have largely expanded, um, the aura has expanded to reinforce the sort of strict Vimeism. Yet, yet, I would have said that, yet in 2020, there was a Can Canada Revolution encampment just west of the memorial, right on the square of people that are very much of the same um, politics of the current convoy. They were camped there for six months before they received a single no camping bylaw infraction, 
which really at the time blew my mind because it is such a highly securitized site. I still don't comprehend how that was allowed. We have no, there no homeless people are, are booted out of their tents nightly, but there was an encampment here for six months. So that's, it's um, part of, of the life of this part. Okay, um, another monument I want to talk about briefly is this, monument here this is just down the street from the national war memorial on in a small park um, and it is a monument that was unveiled on december 6 1992 for canadians you might be recognized this as an anniversary it was the third anniversary of what is called the montreal massacre um, a moment when uh, one man murdered 14 female engineering students in montreal um, but this monument, so it's a violence against women monument, but it came from very local Ottawa, an Ottawa group that had been addressing violence against women in very um, grassroots ways. They weren't a monument committee. They were a gr group of healthcare workers that would stand vigil outside of hospital rooms where women had were there and, and the, the abusers were not incarcerated. Um, but they also planted trees in this small park. Um, and they, in 1992, they, um, um, they built, they fundraised very small budget um, and hired two artists uh, to build this, this monument. Um, but this monument, now what is the inscription? The inscription on it also came from the committee. It reads, to honor and grieve all women abused and murdered by men. Um, imagine a world I don't have the rest of the quote where women are, are free, something to that extent. Um, but they name men as the uh, um, perpetrators of violence. And this caused some um, pushback from people um, to which the committee said, well, they have said, you're vilifying men. And the committee said, we are vilifying men, sure. We are vilifying men who think it is okay to abuse and murder women. That is, and that is that is fine. Men who do not agree with that will not read themselves in this inscription. Um, what what's remarkable about this monument is they began with eight markers. Each one of those small rocks, stones has a name of an Ottawa woman that was murdered by a man starting in 1992. It started with eight. The committee continued to place rocks until the year 2000. Um, they stopped. For reasons of space. And the group disbanded because it is a very exhausting high burnout activity doing this type of work. Um, this monument, as, as I said, it had a full budget of $10,000. There's a monument down um, that is in my overflow material. <laughs> I'll just show you quickly. Uh, there's a monument down uh, the street, the Human Rights Monument here. This one Celebrating Human Rights had a budget of about $70,000 and was supported by all segments of society. Um, but this one here, $10,000 and no funding to continue the markers. I um, encourage us to think about the relationship between this monument and the War Memorial. The War Memorial commemorates the deaths of 60,000 most, mostly young, uh, mostly uh, young Canadian um, men, but their deaths are imagined to be formative of the birth of the nation, right? A loaded sort of narrative, and that is what is presented here. The deaths of everyday women in Ottawa are incompatible with our landscape. It is tucked away and it is incomplete. What I, I encourage people to think, what and how could this monument work differently if, in fact, the 54 other markers that are missing there to commemorate the 54 women that have been murdered since they stopped placing markers in Ottawa by men since the year 2000 took over this park and fled and, and you know, cut into the street, stopping traffic the way the war memorial literally um, does. Um, so my last point, I don't I haven't been looking at time at all. But my last um, point of, of comparison 
is this this monument to the right, the Violence Against Women, these are both very much in my um, neighborhood. And I am every day, especially this season, really struck by the um, everyday lives of these monuments in winter. And how the one, well, the War Memorial now is fenced off because of the convoy, um, but it was defaced and now it's fenced off, but it is routinely, the snow is removed. You can see there, it's a very, this was last winter, there was a lot of snow. In contrast, our Violence Against Women Monument in a small city park has no upkeep and is defaced by neighborhood dogs regularly. And this kind of strikes me as a part of this sort of everyday life uh, that is very reflective of the certain public feelings that we have around this everyday violence against women, right? One, defacement of the war memorial is met with outrage and hits at our collective spirit, but violent, this, this is another type of public feeling. There's, we have this indifference that's going on. In the right. Okay, I will conclude there. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Tanya. Um, we're now uh, going to have, um, thanks for the, the three presentations, which I, I think you'll all agree with me, um, were very illuminating. And I'm sure you have your thoughts and, and questions. Um, please post them. I, I've seen at least uh, one come in um, uh, for, any particular um, panelist or to all the panelists, if you wish. Um, and maybe we'll start by having, I'm, I'm sure the panelists listening to each other had thoughts and questions. So maybe we'll start that way. Um, if any of you have thoughts or questions you'd like to pose to the, the others, um, we we'll welcome that at this point. Um, I don't I don't know how to stop share of the video. I can't I can't find it. So feel free to oh here it is. It's on my other screen. I found it. Handel, I'll start there off with that one. I, I would like to compliment um the team at the university formerly known as Ryerson for what what is a the most the boldest proposal I have ever seen in this space. As I mentioned, I reviewed dozens of US um, memorial disputes and several universities in the US are named after um, former Confederate leaders like Washington and Lee University. They're named after um, first president George Washington and Robert E. Lee. They explored that name and they, they made it clear they weren't gonna remove that name. And several other universities, great universities, Stanford and Yale have connections in, in their own name with colonization and the, um, the Atlantic slave trade. Um, and none of them entertained for a second the notion of a name change. So I think what Ryerson did, or the institution formerly known as Ryerson was, was very bold and courageous and a model for really taking on the, the most difficult challenge is the university's name. That's its brand. That's how it recruits students. That's how it sell sells t-shirts. That's how faculty members decide to join the university. That's symbols of the athletic program. Um, so universities were willing to rename buildings and remove a statue or two, but none in the US were, were bold enough to consider a name change at this point. So uh, I compliment the team that made that proposal and the university that accepted and adopted that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ainsley. As I said, it was really a, a team effort and we heard from many, many uh, people as well on that. I, I think the willingness to, to rename the university speaks to the harm that we heard the name was doing and the loss of opportunities uh, you know, less of a consideration than the harm. Nonetheless, uh, the university's reputation was was being tarnished by continuing to to keep the name. So I guess that's the flip side of what you were saying about recruitment, about retention, about uh, reputation, is that in fact, uh, we had reached a point where we were also hearing that there were uh, negative sides to keeping the name, uh, although the harm that it was doing was, uh, I would say, the, 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 main, the main driver. And then uh, 
uh, again, moving on to choosing a new name, of course, um, it needs to be a name that, that does not do harm. And that's, that, that, that will be a challenge uh, in itself. Um, any hard, do, do, I, I think it's almost hard this day and age to name a facility after any person, right? Because in another generation, there's likely to be something discovered about that person or, or their ancestors that, that the, those who named it were unaware of. Um, I think that's why we have, we have pivoted to naming things after um, um, you know, uh, geographical um, mm -hmm. landscapes, indigenous values, um, using um, earth and sea creatures, you, you know, using things that, you know, orca will likely not be disputed in a hundred years, right? You know, no. we, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there, there are ways for universities to, to look at things. The, the yeah. challenge in, in yeah. US universities have been the money that sometimes goes behind it, right? Uh, I appreciate Tanya's conversations about going back to the ancestors or the, the great niece of someone from the past. And what do you think she's gonna say? Remove my great uncle's name? Um, yeah. And in fact, in some US institutions, they have done that and they've used it to defend retain the memorials. And in some places, the, the ancestors of somebody have said, you know what, it, it is right. My uncle was not a very good person. I, I support the university changing this name. But in US universities, it's very much connected to revenue. Well, then I think another way too of, of thinking about names that uh, came out in the task force is, is not to think of them as something that needs to be permanent. Uh, or indeed pieces of public art such as statues. I know Tanya, I'm sure can speak much more authoritatively to this, but uh, to, to give them, for example, a, a term, perhaps less for, for a university's name, but a piece of public artwork, a statue, um, and say, you know, this will be reviewed every three years or it will be reviewed after five years or not understand it as, as something that once installed can never be questioned, once named, uh, can never be questioned. So I think that's that's a, a more current idea, perhaps, that uh, could help us move through some of those situations. But we have uh, culturally, I think, often a strong attachment to the idea, like like naming a person. And yet, and yet, we can change our own names. We can change our first names. Until fairly recently, it was very common for for women upon marriage. It was expected often uh, for them to change their surnames. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon to change names, and yet when you named a building or you named an institution or you put up a statue, it was somehow understood to be um, permanent. Um, yeah. um, and th thanks so much. Uh, Tony, I think you want to say something. So there's some questions that have started coming in, but um, uh, Tony, uh, you were going to raise something. Yeah, I, th I just think the this idea of um, ancestors is, is really um, compelling because monuments can be an inheritance that is quite burdensome, like other types of inheritances, right? Like people, when you inherit like knickknacks or something, there is this sort of this pressure, this onus to hold on to it, but it 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 is it is worthwhile to consider the other ways that we can honor the past that do not do do harm um, in the present. And there are so many things like I'm sure um, Ainsley, you saw in your <coughs> studies, there are, well, the eight, eight were relocated, things are relocated, they're contextualized, um, but also artists and young and youth have such creative um, and meaningful things, ways to engage with these sort of burdensome and fair inheritances of monuments, I think could, I'd be curious if, if Catherine, if you could tell us the story of um, the fate of the Ryerson statue, because I think it was quite interesting, wasn't it? Well, there's there's not a whole lot that I know, in fact. Um, it, it was pulled down on June 6th, 2021, following a, a peaceful demonstration. Um, and it, it was, um, parts of it were removed, including the head and one finger. Uh, the head was taken down to the harbor, I believe, in Lake Ontario, the Toronto Harbor, and then it came out and it was taken um, to a, a site of Indigenous uh, land protest. 
where I, I don't know if it's still there, um, quite possibly it is, but the, 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 the body of the statue was moved, put into storage by the university. It, it is owned by the university. Uh, we did make some inquiries about that to see whether the city owned it or, um, but it is owned by the university and it's, it's in storage. And one of our recommendations is that, um, you know, further options be considered about what to do with it, uh, but it, it will not be restored or, or, um, or, or replaced. But where it is, um, I, I don't know. Okay, I, I want to turn now to the, the questions that have been coming into the chat, um, and I, I'll I'll pose them in the in the order in which they, they've they've come in. Uh, the first one I think is directed to Ainsley, but I think it's one that um, uh, all three of you might um, might have something to say about. Um, this is um, from Clara Bishop. And she says, hi, I'm a student at Western Washington University. I'm working on a project that is attempting to stage a community intervention and tell the critical history of Pickett House, a Confederate memorial dedicated to General George E. Pickett in Bellingham, Washington. I was curious about the idea around art as a method of intervention. So, Art as intervention. I mean, I I, uh, I think that's maybe too well. The, the specific example is from the U.S., but I think it can pertain to the Canadian situation as well. What do you think of? What do people think of art as a way of intervening um, in the discourse around uh, monuments? And, and Handel, I appreciate your use of use of the, the term discourse because the four frameworks that I mentioned, um, principle, examining the principal legacy, what is preservation and what does it mean to preserve something, but what is landscape fairness and which standards we should use, neither of those point in one direction or the other. The, the intended outcome is that communities grapple with this, like they struggle with it. They, they debate both sides of it. Sometimes there aren't, there aren't both, there aren't two sides, but they should struggle with it. And one of the ways to struggle with this is to talk about um, counter monuments. In some universities have said, okay, we're gonna do additional monuments to, to represent the diversity of our campus. And some institutions have also looked at um, counter memorials, like, like I mentioned, counter monuments, contextualization. How do we put something next to it that, that also communicates something about what this means and what this stands for? It is hard to contextualize the Confederacy. It is hard to contextualize um, owning enslaved people, um, taking indigenous people and removing them from their land. It is hard to put up a piece of artwork that justifies that history in so many places. And I don't know if that's the focus of the question, but um, I haven't seen art overly used other than in, in an effort to create a counter memorial to say, in addition to this memorial that exists here, we're gonna counter it by putting something right next to it. The University of Kentucky had a memorial that depicted slavery and indigenous people in very stereotypical ways they attempted to add a counter memorial next to it, the protest continued, it, it, it never stopped. And they eventually moved the memorial that depicted slavery. So I could see it as an effort, but it's not sustainable. It, it will not lead to the protesters ending their concerns or the harm stopping from being done. Uh, Tanya? Well, you're muted. Um, I, I just, yeah, okay. Um, at the Champlain Monument, and I just want to show you a picture because it is, it is really, wait just one second. Uh, useful. So they moved, I told you, I, I was mentioning, they moved this monument to um, a very racist monument of an indigenous scout. Um, and since then, the empty plinth has been a great site for artistic intervention. There's a, a photographer named Jeff Thomas who staged all sorts of photographs there. And this artist, uh, well, Jeff Thomas here, he took this photo of another artist, um, Greg Hill, who made this cereal box canoe that he took 
to many sites, including um, this, this spot. And I really love his work because it highlights, um, well, it doesn't highlight, it, it was the source of how I arrived at, it's part of how I arrived at this idea of monuments as always, um, off having within them the kernel of their own disrupt, disruption, right? Um, so art can really tease at what's unsaid in monuments and reveal all the buried sort of um, histories and memories, et cetera. So I think there's a real, there's a real place for, for artistic intervention. Uh, thanks. That was a, that was a wonderful concrete um, uh, illustration and answer. And thanks, Ainsley, for your response as well. I think this next question is for for Catherine specifically. Um, it's from uh, Rachel uh, Fuladi, um, and she says, uh, "Thank you so much for this discussion. Speaks to the lived impact of monuments names for Dr. Ellis. When was the last name change at Ryerson?" My dad have assisted in the openness to change. Uh, I am at Simon Fraser University, an alumna of uh, UBC. Uh, the last name change was, I could look up the exact date, but um, it was when the university uh, became a university. So it started out as the Ryerson Institute of Technology, and then it became the Ryerson Polytechnical Institute, and then it became Ryerson Polytechnic uh, University, and then it became Ryerson University. So the name changes uh, reflected the kind of different um, types of institution that it became over time. Uh, it became a university in the early 1990s. So Ryerson, yeah, I just seen in the chat, uh, Ryerson has always been in the name, that's right. That's right. It was chosen originally um, not because he, uh, the man himself, had any connection whatsoever. He was long dead um, for decades before the institution was established in 1948. Uh, it was chosen because the statue was already on the site. It was the site of the normal school, the teacher training <coughs> college um, that he was associated with. And um, in 1948, when the founders of this new uh, Institute of Technology were looking for a name, they considered several different names, Toronto Institute of Technology, Ontario Institute of Technology, things like that. Um, they were modeling it on Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, in fact, right after the Second World War, Canada didn't have any such thing between uh, like a college and a university. And so the, the founders, um, Howard Kerr in particular, the first principal thought that Canada needed that kind of institution to train people after high school, uh, after the war. And uh, so the, as he, his, he recounted, and we have the archives and his own account of, of how he got to the name, he, he saw the statue and he, he recognized the name. And he thought that naming it after Edgerton Ryerson, who was well known as the founder of Ontario's public school system, would lend immediate credibility to a brand new institution that had to recruit students very quickly. And so the name was approved by the Ontario government in the summer of 1948, and the institute opened in, in September 1948. So it was a search for immediate uh, legitimacy and credibility and, and recognition. It was effectively a branding uh, tool, but he looked around, saw the statue, and thought, oh, well, here's, you know, here's a name we can use that, that will resonate as, uh, as an institution that needs to get off the ground quickly. Um, I think the, uh, the, 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 the last name change uh, was in 2000, was when it switched from Ryerson Polytechnic University to Ryerson University, just the two words. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine. Um, now this, this question, and probably this is where we'll, we'll we, this might be the final question, um, sort of gets at the, the kind of conceptual frame that Tonya and Ainsley have used. And it comes from uh, after uh, Efan, who was here at UBC and now is with the city of Vancouver. Um, uh, we can't see you, but wish we could see you. Uh, we miss you at UBC, Efan, uh, uh, after. Um, Aftab says, I'm wondering if Ainsley has any comment on Tanya's comment regarding using a logical and objective colonial slash white process 
to decide on whether a memorial should be removed or not. Uh, it reminded me of the idea of using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house and whether that's possible. Wow, I, I think that's that's a great question. And when Tanya said that, it made so much sense. I thought, oh yes, that does make a lot of sense. Um, the frameworks that I identified weren't frameworks that, that I gave birth to on my own. These were frameworks that after reading nearly 50 responses to memorial disputes, you, you know, as a quantitative, a qualitative researcher, you start to see themes and patterns, right? Like, oh, this keeps coming up. Oh, this keeps coming up. Oh, this keeps coming up. Or like you see the themes and patterns that emerge and collectively over a year or two years of, of examining these and listening to the disputes, I identified what the themes were that were coming up. And the, and the challenge was that no single university was, was like examining all of the themes. They, they, they would pick one. Right, so let's let, let's pick. They would just say the principal legacy. They would dive into the principal legacy and, and then agree that listen, this person did positive things and this person did negative things. However, at the end of the day, their life has more positive things. Like you can pick any historical leader, not just those from a hundred years ago. We look at leaders today, political leaders today, um, sports leaders, um, doctors, lawyers who have had this kind of made this horrible mistake but they spent much of their life doing this super positive thing, right? You, you pick any leader that we admire, you can find something in their lifetime that we would question about. So when we only focused on the principal legacy, you come to one answer and, and we get it and it's over. However, there's a group of people who are saying, there's something else I would like to bring up. And that's what the multi-frame thinking emerges. That, that's why I'm saying there are other considerations that must be disputed, not in an effort to defend the memorial, but to also say this has an impact on indigenous people, women, children, like there are other perspectives that don't get a chance to emerge when we pick one point of view. So no matter what it is, I, I still stand in the position that we must grapple with these things. And what are the tools for grappling? But how do we want to do that, right? We can sit in, I, I thought the Ryerson process was a very collaborative, community, um, indigenous-minded process. And, and that's a framework for thinking about it as well, right? So whatever, however we enter this space, we must enter this space with some type of frame to establish what is the groundwork that we are operating from? We will all agree to respect one another. Let's all agree that people have different opinions. Let's all agree that this is emotionally taxing for everyone, right? So I, I think the frameworks that the multi-frame thinking I am suggesting simply implies that going into these disputes, we must come with some type of framework that we can share and everyone would agree to, to, to moving forward in that path. Otherwise, I think it's a lot of noise and no one is, is, is hearing what's going on. So, but I do agree with Tanya's point that, you know, we have to consider where's this frame coming from? Mm -hmm. um, uh, th thanks so much, uh, Ainsley. Um, I'm, I'm seeing the time now and it's uh, 2.30. So I, I think we should be wrapping up this session. Um, I wanna thank uh, everybody for being here. Um, when, when we speak of frames, I, I remember my first uh, response to, uh, to Catherine was it was so interesting how much uh, our indigeneity played a role in this. Um, I, I'd like to end, um, instead of us just wrapping this up in a bow, I'd like to end uh, almost in the way that Ainsley has done by opening things up somewhat to say that even the ways in which we're questioning these things and raising issues, um, uh, I think uh, AFTAB's question has been uh, a generative one, not only for the discussion between what Tonya critiqued as a frame and what Ainsley has put together that we need a frame, to say that um, there's, there's almost no completely innocent ground on which to stand and do this work. So even the attempts at making these corrections are not themselves uh, completely innocent, and there can be ways in which um, um, even those can in turn uh, be uh, problematized or at least not be thought of as purely corrective. Um, reminds me of uh, Stuart Hall's 
uh, idea of um, um, uh, that, that we can't do simply innocent ways of, of thinking uh, uh, of being black. So in some ways we have to think of even the critiques of monuments and the frames that we use about them. Because what happened in South Africa is there was all this move to decolonization. But part of what happened in that move is that certain voices, for example, around gender issues became sidelined. Very interesting that we now want to move to decolonization, but it need not include a kind of feminist view, that we need to move towards decolonization, but it needs to be particularly black in a way in which for some people, um, uh, um, South Asian and other kinds of uh, voices uh, need not be prominent. So even in the, in the process of correction, we might have uh, other issues, but the process of uh, opening up what we think of monuments, what we think of honorees, what we think of symbols is a very, very important one as uh, Ainsley started us of thinking about, um, and as Catherine gave us in a very concrete example, a very bold one, uh, and as Tanya, um, illustrated to us, of course, goes way beyond university campuses. Um, what we're thinking of is, in the end, um, a more equitable society, a more representative society, and institutions that reflect that. And I hope that this discussion has helped us all to think in those ways and towards those ends. And I want to uh, end by just thanking the three presenters for such um, wonderful presentations and uh, all of you for being here and, and for a rigorous and fine discussion. So thank you very much. I think we'll end at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Handel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Anya, Catherine, thank you and pleasure to meet both of you. Yes.